you know, because with Tommy on, uh, uh, we, we did the quantum leap and he, uh, he recommended me, you always got to go in and win the job yourself, but he recommended me to the Spielberg people, the Sequest, so I got a year out of that. Thanks, thank you, Tom. And John D'Aquino. Yeah. Also, did John did two years on Sequest. Not doing time, it was a good show. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to ask uh, all of you uh, what kind of projects you have going. Start down on the end with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as of now, right now, I did Les's house, but it was canceled. <laughs> and the, now I'm working on home improvement. Woo! Um, hey. um, I just finished doing two plays on uh, in New York. Uh, I'm back here to try to find something to do. Hopefully. Uh, um, I'm back here for pilot season, or hunting season, as I like to call it. Um, yeah, I just finished doing two plays. Um, uh, there's one play that Steve Martin wrote called Picasso de la Pan Agile, that was here in Los Angeles right before some time. Another play at Lincoln Center called Twelve Dreams. And um, prior to that, I did Crazy for You, uh, a Broadway show in New York for three years. So I've been in New York for most of the time, and I'm finally back now, and hopefully I can get uh, something we'll, we'll, we'll hit, and there'll be a series. Or, or something, so we'll see. Uh, I'm working on a couple of things. Uh, I'm working with Don on his new series, Jag. Yeah! Uh, yeah. Uh, really produced one story I put together, the uh, Scimitar episode, which was, uh, I wrote the original story that they based that on, and we're working on another SEAL episode now, and we'll meet next Wednesday with the uh, writers. And uh, the hard part is trying to get harm with, you know, believably into a SEAL mission. You know? <laughs> and so I told him, what does harm bring to the table, the table that SEALs need? Basically not much. He's trying to fly aircraft, so it becomes very difficult to try and make that work. And so that's what we're kind of knocking heads over. Um, and I'm focusing on writing you know, at the UCLA school in the Advanced Professional Screenwriting Program. Uh, where you write a feature-length script every uh, ten weeks. Wow. Oh, keeps you good. beginning to end. Yeah, it uh, keeps you hopping. In fact, I, I was working this afternoon. I brought my laptop in. You know, every second I got to be fixing, working. You know, go to class and they bring up everybody who reads what you have, and they say, "No, this doesn't work for me over here. Well, this doesn't work for me here. We need more of this." And you try to digest all that and see what really works for you. So uh, that's what I'm doing. No. This demo was magnificent, his show on Broadway, just fabulous, and I think my a friend of mine, was Tom, Tom Toner? Tom Toner, you mean in the, in the show? Of course, the musical. The crazy thing? Yeah. No, Tom Toner was not oh. in the show. He was. He might have been in the, later on. Later on, but you were just fabulous, oh, okay. fabulous in that show. Thank you. Um, <laughs> right now I'm playing uh, Wilhelm. Uh, uh, George's boss on Seinfeld. Yeah. I just directed a play that opened last night at the uh, the Road Theater Company. I'm very pleased with. As a matter of fact, it's written by a fellow actor, a friend. It's a wonderful play. James Morrison plays McQueen on Space Above and Beyond. Has written this play called Iron Wheels, and it's about his youth. He, he grew up in Alaska. It takes place in the trailer in 1973 outside of Alaska, outside of Anchorage. And it's filled with mysticism, murder, abuse, incest, all those lovely things. <laughs> and it, it's been an exhausting adventure for all the, uh, the actors and myself to go into that area of our lives. But if we do go into those areas of our lives. But it opened last night at the Theatre Company. It's been around for six weeks. This past season, too, I was very fortunate to be able to work with my lovely wife uh, under Jules Aaron's direction. And we won Drama Log Awards for our performances uh, as Willie and Linda Lohman in uh, Death of Salesman. We did that over here. <laughs> and uh, I did a picture uh, recently with Malcolm McDowell, which is a sci-fi theme. Uh, kind of reminds me of when I did Trances, the original Trances, but it's so good. It's called Yesterday's Target. That should be coming up. And quite soon, um, uh, Easter sometime, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I played uh, Dan Aykroyd and Steve Martin's commanding officer in, uh, not, not the fourth part, the uh, General Tennyson in Sergeant Bill. Oh, boring resume, but thank God. You know,
what I felt allowed you uh, to afford to continue in the theater. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be able to travel around the regional theater, the Cleveland Playhouse, the Old Globe, the Alley. Uh, when you have a burn, you have to have a burning desire because you don't make any money in the theater. Uh, you know, unless you're in New York and you can get, get the price up. But if there's a play you really want to do and it's not being done in New York, that one of the fine is, you know, there are all these fine, the Denver Center of the Performing Arts. There are so many good theaters in America. And if an opportunity comes along uh, to do one of those parts, you got to go. But hopefully the, these things will continue to come my way so I can afford them. But, but uh, I'm happy to be here and see you all again. Thank you. Oh, and tomorrow night, commercial, <laughs> 9 o'clock on ABC uh, with Mel, uh, what's her name? Mel, oh yes, lovely lady. Mel, Mel Harris and Valerie Bertinelli. I play their dad in a movie of the week called uh, A Case for Life. So I hope you all tune in more. Nine o'clock, ABC. It's two hour movie of the week. Question in the back. Yeah, I have a question for, for Richard Hood. Yeah. Um, well, what do you think the character would have done if Stan told him who he really was? What, 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 what? what would your character do if Sam had told you who he really was? I would have uh, had him collaborate with me so we could both go back in time. <laughs> I had, I was very close to remember with the string, I almost had it. You know, he would have sorted it out for me, and bingo, we would have gone back, I would have got terrible, terrible reviews, and I would have been able to spend more time with my kids. <laughs> situation uh, in television where a director comes in and really does not know what he or she um, is doing. I mean, it's very frustrating, not only for the actors, but for the, for the crew in particular, because um, if, a, if a director comes in and says, I, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want that, it's much easier for everyone to set everything up, and it's less uh, time consuming. Scotty took the time uh, early on uh, to, to learn um, all about that. And so when he finally got to direct this episode, he knew exactly what he wanted, and the crew just went nuts for him, and they they, uh, they loved him. And he was a doll to work with. He was so much fun. He's uh, um, he's very funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's serious, but it's not you know deadly earnest. And oh my God, what's going to happen if we make a mistake? It's really he's a wonderful man to work with as an actor, but also as a director. So he was he was terrific. Yeah, there's, there's a question right back there, right in the center, or is there one there? Or there's one on the left? Oh, good. Uh, Richard, uh, Tommy Thompson was talking earlier today about how he wanted to kill off Captain Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really glad that didn't happen, but what, had that already been changed by the time you were cast on that? I, that's an interesting story. I was out and about, I had no appointments that day. And evidently they were looking for a comedian to play the role. That's they told me later, stand up and somehow got it. And I happened to call my wife. It was like quarter after twelve and they said they wanted to see you at the university. One o'clock is the cutoff time. So I went over. And I got in at about, oh I guess twenty-five minutes of one, twenty minutes of one. I had never read the script. I just read this one scene. And at one o'clock I was on my way to wardrobe. It was that quick. And then Jean Pierre had to measure me for that suit because it started the next day. And uh, I didn't know anything about that. But an interesting thing happened out of that. Uh, the producers, there was a show called Blossom. And the producers of Blossom, uh, Blossom Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Prince, I think was one of them called and they looked at that. They were considering for a while making it into a series. Me and that character when Mo went back to Milwaukee to see what he would have done and maybe on a, you know an access cable show he would have gone back to doing his old show. And there was some serious thinking about it at the time. And I I would love to have done it because it was 
that was the beginning for me as an actor uh, to do gentler roles. Because up until then, I had, you know, I, when I, in New York, I had done what they call boyish charm parts. And when I came out here, I did nice guys. And once I did China Syndrome, the die was cast. And after that, they, they had me use every weapon known to man. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to get back to uh, doing human beings, people. And two things occurred there. I stopped, I, 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 I just didn't want to wear a hairpiece anymore. I got bloody tired of it. You know, they could put on a hairpiece if they wanted, and you know, they do anyway, or color your hair. And I decided right about that time, you know, I've been in the business like nearly, I've been in the business now nearly 45 years, a member of equity for nearly 45 years. And I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to, they know I didn't want to cut my hair. That was like, to me, one of the very first rules. As soon as that happened, for some reason, I had a need or whatever, I started being able to just do human beings, people. I was one of the first people, truly per dimensional person, that I had done in 15, 20 years. <coughs> It was, really, it was really a pleasure. It was a gift, a gift. It's a treat, I'll tell you. And Scott is like that. Right. <laughs> no, Scott, Scott is wonderful. Uh, as far as the, looking at Dean, um, it, we didn't really have that much. There were a few scenes in there, and those scenes were it was very nice and very sweet and very helpful. Uh, but he is very private. And, and you do the scene, and then he'd leave and wait and set up the next scene, come in and do it. And he was great. Uh, but but Scotty's good in terms of that, that because he's he's very much an actor and he understands what to what to say to you if you're if a certain scene isn't going a certain way he knows what to say. Most of the time in television, if you go up to a director and say, well, how what am I doing at this point or how do I feel at this point? That's the worst thing you can ever say because they will never know. They'll just say, just stand here and just stand here and go here and go here and go here. Most of the time, if you hit your marks 
And I was like, boy, that was an acting boy, didn't he? He was great. It wasn't that great. He hit, he hit that mark, hit that mark. Boy, you're great. You're wonderful. You know? Yeah, but that was Spencer Tracy. Spencer <laughs> Tracy used to say, speak your words, hit uh, uh, say your words, hit your marks, and don't bump into the furniture. <laughs> how, many, how many people have seen Spencer Tracy do this in the movies? He's like this. He does this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, you're not going to get hit. I'm going to get smack you off. But I, there was one where I had to smash the vase over someone's head. Yeah. And it was, they were pretty interesting. But <laughs> no, no, I was able to back away from it. And as for the emotional stuff, I just thought about something sad or something like that. And it was, well, I, I didn't get too emotional over it. I may have had some, like, feelings, but yeah. not too much. Okay, thanks. Uh, but almost to the back on your right. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> this is for Richard, please. Uh, you have had a very long career doing a lot of really, really good character actors and, and stuff. Was it kind of different going into um, the last episode and doing something that I thought was fairly comedic? Was that kind of a stretch for you? Did you enjoy it? Or? Would you speak up, Will? I'm sorry, I have some calls and flew in from Denver. This is it. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, I was uh, complimenting your long career. Um, not that long. <laughs> I started as a child. <laughs> um, and saying that I've seen you do a lot, a very big range of dramatic roles, but I kind of thought what you did in the last episode was pretty comedic, and there were some comedic elements to uh, to Future Boy, too. How did you feel about doing that kind of comedy? Did you Was that kind of fun? I told you earlier, I, made, I used to make my bread and butter early as an actor doing uh, Oscar Wilde stuff, boyish charm, comedies, musicals, and as soon as I did this other thing, that was all forgotten, but that used to be my bread and butter, you know, and I loved it, I really did, and when I went back, uh, you know, doing that, like, uh, I, I, it was, especially it was an accented role, and uh, I've, I've had a lot of opportunity to play all sorts of nationalities, and so on and so on. It was a wonderful opportunity to go back and to, to light the comedic or <coughs> lighter things. Um, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy it. Did they say, um, did they say tragedy? What was that fellow, uh, uh, what's the old actor's story? The fellow dying? His last breath, he looks up at the young actor. What was it about dying is easy? Oh yeah, comedy. What is it? Dying is easy. Comedy is hard. Dying is easy. Comedy is hard. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. It's a whole different sort of timing. And there is a subtext in it, but the, the, the subtext, uh, you know, in a darker role, the noir role, is a little different. But the, it's, it's a different kind. It's an emotional timing in the, in the more dramatic things. But it's all sorts of qualities. Uh, and then it goes beyond that, because when you get the comedy and then you get into a musical, then you have three things. You have many, many things that all have to coordinate. I haven't done one of those in 30 years, a musical, but uh, do I answer your question? It was really a wonderful chance to twinkle a bit. And uh, I was glad I had it to do, and I was able to do it. Thank you for asking. Oh. <coughs> uh, I was wondering, number one, how old you were when you did those two episodes of Quantum Leap. And number two, you had to work very intensely with Scott throughout those two episodes. Being so young especially, was that difficult for you? Did you get flustered by it? Did he make it easier for you? What happened? Um, well, I was about 10 when I did it, and Scott was very nice, and he helped me along. Through it. Um, I wasn't flustered or anything. Because he helped me along, he helped me, he showed me how to do certain things, and and he was just, he was really great about it. Cause he's such a nice person, and he was, he, um, I don't even, I don't even know how to explain it. He was so nice, but it didn't create any bad impression. We have another question. Uh, this is, yeah, this is for Harry. Uh, first of all, um, I thought that your transformation from your uh, part of Dear John yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was quite a transformation. Uh, you were very, very spooky. Uh, I also <laughs> very, very spooky. Uh, I know that uh, you and Scott had a uh, uh, theatrical brush with each other as their life after high school. Yeah. Are you guys that are doing anything else today? Oh, I wish. No, we haven't had a chance to do anything since then. Um, this, as you're referring to a Broadway show called Is Your Life After High School, which had a very 
short run in New York. And at that time, um, Scotty was understudying many roles in that, in that show. And that's, that's how we worked together in the theater. But we never had a chance to, to do a play or a musical um, uh, since then. And it probably was the first time since that, that time. I want to. It would be a ball to work with him on stage. Oh, it was so much fun. Hi, this is for the four of you. I was wondering from what you've been saying, how you get the majority of your jobs from the different series you've done. Has it been mostly from your agents, from producers who've seen you doing the work, from fans who try to let people know that they're out there? Well, for me, it's money. I got paid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I send money. I, I pray a lot. I pray. <laughs> Dinners, take them out, beg, yeah, begging Christmas is good. Cards, I mean, <laughs> you know, you never know. I mean, it's, it, it seems uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Uh, a lot of those jobs, uh, they, they just come out of the blue, and it's just a matter of you being around for a certain number of years, or maybe somebody having seen you in something. Or 50% of what it boils down to now, years ago, I used to get offered a lot of things. At the beginning, I did. You had to go on audition like anybody else, and then I would I would say that 80% of the jobs I got, both in the theater and film, they didn't do a lot of television, and they're just kind of giving me. That's all changed. It's all changed. I would say now it's like 50-50, and if you really want to do something in the theater or, or in film now, and uh, they ask you to read, you've got to go read. I don't mind that. If I want to do something, I'm perfectly willing to go in there and, and do what has to be done. You know, because there are a lot of new people in the business that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a character actor. I know, you know, I'm not a star or anything like that. I'm, you know, I'm not saying that, but I'm very happy with I'm at. Um, I don't have that kind of bankability or high level of recognizability that, you know, they can kind of build a picture. But, you know, third, fourth banana in the picture. But if you really want to, you know, the job, you've got to go out and compete, your agent has to set up the appointments, and blah, 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 blah. And hopefully you'll get it, and you won't. But the whole point is, <laughs> I think it's impossible, really impossible for a professional actor, and I don't mean that just in a clinical way, I'm talking about somebody who really studies and prepares and knows what they're doing. I think it's impossible to give a bad day. It's absolutely impossible, unless you have a bad day. The only thing is you just think one day they want apples, another day they want bananas. Oh, you're too tall, too short, too fat. Anderson wrote a play about that called, uh, uh, is, you know, you can't hit me when the water's running, that Marty Balson did, the thing with the agent, Joe Silver, he did it on Broadway. And there's this actor, God bless you, Marty's gone now. And that play is all about how an actor does it, doesn't get a job. You want hair, you don't want hair. You want me fat, you want me skinny, big, short, whatever. And it all depends really on that particular, you, you, you usually get the job coming through the door. That's it. And I'll tell you another thing, you can prepare your butt off and lose, or you can go and work five minutes and walk and get a job. It's, who knows, but you just have to go in feeling good. No chip on your shoulder, no sweat. Just do it, and then go home. At the beginning, it was difficult. When you start off as a young actor, you know, you have a lot of expectations, and you're very strongly focused, and you've got a burning desire. I mean, you're willing to kill. <laughs> really, and, and that's all part of the mechanism the drive, the force, the ambition, the energy. Because today, when I started, I, you know, I had some classes, of course, but today they've got so many wonderful opportunities. They always had Carnegie in the neighborhood playoffs and Goodman, but they have so many wonderful programs now throughout America. So all the young people coming into business today, be they clones or not, they're all very prepared. They're very prepared. So somebody coming in with no experience, they to really work hard because it's, I think it's a lot more difficult out there today for younger people, you know, 18, 19, 20, than it was for me. Because I had summer stock and all that stuff. They don't have any of that. It's not there. The training program's gone. Okay, we have five minutes left. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Kimberly. Um, I was wondering what the hardest part is about being a young actor and different against and if 
one gets it and the other doesn't, and it's kind of like, maybe one gets hurt or something. But as for being the youngest on the set, I, everyone I've worked with is so nice to me. And it's really amazing because I haven't worked with anyone I don't like. Everyone that I like. And so it's really great. I haven't had any bad experiences. I live in the valley here, and I call this like my channel, and maybe you can help me. I would like to see V again. Do you know who I could write to or who I could call? You want to see V again? That was very good. Yeah. V, you mean the 10-hour miniseries? Yeah. It just came out on tape, I was told today. On video? It's on video now, the entire 10 hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, a young man, I, I was in a Star Trek thing this morning. And, and uh, a young man there uh, recognized me from, uh, well, you know, you got to play a thing on once in a while and pay the mortgage. So, and he told me that it's, all, it's, it's on. But what they've done, you see, that's another, that's another Hollywood thing. Uh, the, uh, you may not know it, but when an actor does a, 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 a film or a television series and it's shown overseas, the actor gets paid three times for foreign reruns. It's one check, two checks, three checks. Now they can be for nothing or a little more than nothing. It, you know, they used to be more generous than they are. Once you've had those three showings, you don't see zilch. They produce his own in perpetuity. So the, the, when you see a series on the 20, 30 years, like in Europe, whatever, actors not getting zilch on that. Now with V, what they did, because they wanted to make a movie, they called, and then they decided not to. They took those 10 hours and they cut them down to 20 half hours. Then they took the series that ran for a year, and they took the 26, and they cut. So they were able to, they were able to comic book them. They ended up with 60 half-hour episodes, which they uh, they put uh, narration on to make sense. And they sold it to Korea, New Zealand, Australia, <coughs> blah 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 blah. Now the actors who got the pay on the three foreign reruns, like myself in the miniseries, I did a miniseries. It went to a series I never saw another penny on. Zilch. I mean, I got paid for my three miniseries reruns in, in throughout the world. That means throughout the world. And to be perfectly frank with you, it amounts to what? Less than a thousand dollars? It amounts to less than a thousand dollars. Seven, eight hundred dollars. And when they took it and put it onto a series, which I didn't sign a series contract, I still didn't see that. So I mean, that's the same thing with Quantum Leap. Less when all our quantum leaps are paid, played overseas, it has nothing to do, it's just the deal that's made. You know, that's their job, this our job. I mean, I'd like to see that end of the bargain sweetened some more, because they're living back, they're paying what they paid 30 years ago. You can't live on that with inflation. I mean, a dollar 30 years ago was worth 90 cents. Today it's five bucks. So a lot of people think, you know, actors getting residuals. It's on a declining scale. That's why there's no sympathy for actors when they go on strike. Because they think all actors are wealthy and have a famous looking wives and live in big homes with swimming pools. I mean, that's the perception of the actor. So there is no sympathy for an actor when he goes on strike. And a lot of the actors today are not making, I, I just have to tell you this, I, because it upsets me, and I'm sorry to burden you with it. But I have many friends that are in this business for a long time, and they don't have medical coverage because they can't make enough money in a year to get, and it's not that much, $7,500 to go to level two. They can't make it. And the reason they can't make it is because the cable residual is getting so low, they can't make enough money in a year to get covered. It's wrong. Isn't it true that 5% uh, or less of the Screen Actors Guild make $5,000? 1%. Only 1% is, I think it's less. 1% makes the 12500 which I think is plan one on the medical. 1%. Now you look at the extras, bless their hearts. I'm talking about Screen Actors Guild, New York, or here now. They don't make nearly as much money as a principal player. They have to work 65 bucks a day. They got to work $7,500 a year for Plan 2, 12, 5, for Plan 1. I'm just putting this in perspective for you so that we can all get back into Quantum Leap <laughs> and, you know, fix this residual thing with Saturday Beckett. <laughs> Following this one last question, there will be autographs here. If those people wishing autographs would line up, 
down the center aisle. Not yet, but when that happens. <laughs> right now, our one last question. All right, make it a good one. Are we over on the right? You're on your right. All right. Rachel told you online before that on um, Jamie that my son has chosen you as his role model because uh -oh. he wants to be he wants very much to go into the Navy, but he also wants very much to go into showbiz. And I was curious <laughs> as to how you made the switch. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. well the short of it is uh, I started performing and stuff when I was like nine and, and ten and I was in I did some plays, but I was always on stage, either in bands or doing public speaking. And then Vietnam came around, my draft number was low, uh, my butt was gone. And uh, I came from the Naval Academy family, so I got veered off in the Navy for 10 years. Uh, four years in Annapolis, uh, I was in year, I listed for a year for Annapolis, four years in Annapolis, and five years with SEAL teams. And then that was as early as I could get out. As soon as I got out, I formed a recording studio and got back into involved with uh, performing. Um, it's not a route you really want to go if you want to be in this business. <laughs> the SEAL training is not well, it's to be in show business, yeah. When I decided that it was time that I, I really wanted to be here, I just didn't know how to get out of here. I didn't have anybody in the family that could say, Oh, well, you know, they actually had, I know they had schools that could teach you screenwriting and acting. I, you know, I came from small areas where I thought guys either did it or they didn't do it. And um, if I'd known those things earlier, I probably would have made different choices. But um, if he wants to, to act, I would say there are so many wonderful avenues to pursue. We don't have a war, but you have to go off and fight, so I'd say ignore the name. <laughs> Unless you want to get, you know, there are some people that go in the Navy because they can pay for your education. And, uh, and I think it's always important to have education uh, if for another reason to have a fallback or have something to do where you're trying to get your active break. And now I have all these skills I can rely on to keep me going. So I hate to end on that kind of question. <laughs> we got another question? Well, we, there will be an auction drawing. Just a moment, as you can see, and we'd like to thank you very much for our Thank you, Thank you. Okay, we're drawing items. Drawing items. Okay, drawing items number one and number two. First will be uh, anchors away, video signed by Dean Stockwell. <laughs> You could just remain seated, please. Oh, could you just remain seated during the auction, please? Thank you. You'll have plenty of time to get into line, trust me. Yeah, that'll be a long line. If you could just remain seated, we'd all appreciate it. That'll be a long line. Three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, <laughs> All right, well, we'll keep that one. Sure. Oh, she got it. Oh. You got it? Two, what is it? 360399? 360299? Come on down. Wait, let's go. Come on, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the editor of 
from Worcester Road over the line, Miss Marjorie Monaghan. sitting in the box giving his testimony, um, they shot it a way that uh, you did not get to see. Origi I, I was asking someone backstage about this. They, the young uh, actress who actually was playing the woman, they, I think they panned off Scott or something, and then she ended up, you're nodding, so <laughs> thank you. And she ended up giving his testimony. She was a very good actress, and it was a very good monologue that she had. 
But we shot it a different way first. Scott wanted to try it. Um, I actually, I think it was Scott's idea, but I'm, I'm, I think that's the way it was. They wanted to try having Scott do the whole thing and not having the actress do it. So Scott did the monologue as the female rape victim. And it was, it was fabulous. And you never got to, no one ever got to see it, but he was, I mean, he had tears streaming down his face at the end of it, you know, and as did everyone, and everyone was like, and then they, you know, they decided to bag it because they, I mean, they, they decided to go with it. I guess they decided it was going to be too confusing or something, but it was fascinating the way they shot it first. And, and I thought Scott was so fabulous, you know, I was sorry for him, but uh, no one got to see it. James. Oh, uh, uh, hi. Uh, oh, God, how many here have seen Seabride? Oh. Don't call me Vinny. Ah, uh, ah, uh, what do I say, what do I say? God, it was great fun uh, uh, doing it. This is one of the most fun groups of people, nicest groups of people that produced, worked on, directed, starred in Quantum Leap of any show I've ever done to this day, still, starting with Scott Dean every month. It's, it was a great experience to do this. Um, I've had the good fortune of working with uh, John Hertzler, who played Bev Leach's dad, the one that cold <laughs> cocks me in the end there. Uh, both he and Michael Watkins, who was the director of photography, and I guess he was here yesterday, uh, we worked on a project in Las Vegas for about 12 days, uh, uh, an NBC special event, uh, which was actually the just most world's most expensive infomercial. Uh, it was called Treasure Island. It was shown after the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, and they blew up the Dunes Hotel for it. It was really just to promote, what's his name, Treasure Island Casino. Um, that we worked together again in that. Um, specific recollections of it, it was just such great fun, but I just related a story backstage that I think uh, probably continues to this day to be one of my most embarrassing moments ever. We shot for about three days at the Queen Mary down in Long Beach, uh, shot on and around the ship, and we had, and it was very late night shooting. And there's a huge parking lot out there, and I was always called a little later than some people. When you get there late with a shoot like that, you, you park far away from everybody else because it's the only spot left. But when you come out at 4.30 in the morning, there are only three cars in the lot. Um, so it's easy to find yours. However, down there, they have a lot of fog, so they have these fog lights, these yellow lights that are in parking lots. Now, my car at the time was red, very bright red, uh, fire engine red. Um, but these fog lights turn everything to gray, so everything looks the same, and you can't tell one color from another. And I came out at 4.30 in the morning, having worked there for two or three days, very tired, and I came out to the parking lot, and my car wasn't there. It was stolen. Who would want to steal an 83 Chevy Cavalier? I don't know. <laughs> But it was gone, and I freaked out. I'm running around, I'm in Long Beach. How am I gonna get home? What's going on? They're gonna pay for this. This is ridiculous. I called the AD, I called the first AD, the second AD. Where is my car? My car, I take them all around the lot. Look, look, there are no cars here. There's three cars. Yeah, well look, my car, well I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks just like that Chevy Cavalier, that gray one. <laughs> That's why they didn't hire me again. <laughs> Actually, I did work for Donald Belisarius again on uh, Tequila and Bonetti. You know that show? Yeah. I like the way they were. Yeah. That's a convention. That's convention. That's yes, 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 right. I don't think there will be a convention. <laughs> so the point of that story is don't have James get your car. For that's right. <laughs> we have a question. It's up the middle and your right. Uh, this question is for this question is for Marjorie. I just wanted to ask you what you could tell us about working with that lion. <laughs> the lion was was a lot of fun actually, and I'd worked with animals before, not with a lion, but so I had some awareness of just the nature of working with large animals. In this case, wild meat eating animals. Um, you know, extremely well trained, but still, the the trainer had to, to get on people after the second day. People start treating. The lion's name was Sudani, the, the, the actor's name. 
And, uh, and so Downing would lay around, and people, after like two days of his being well, very well behaved, people start treating him like he's a piece of furniture. And the trainer says, no, 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 this is still a lion. You, know, like, you can't just walk right past him and step over him. You just don't do that. But he was, we spent, I guess, four days with the lion. And there was one of the scariest things that I've ever had to do was when there's this thing where I, I run away and the lion grabs me and then I go and I'm on the bridge. <coughs> okay, well, and I duck down and I pass out. And the lion is standing on the table above me, you know, looking at me. Well, I'm laying there on the bridge, you know, and the lion's on the table. Because they're shooting, like, over his shoulder, they took, they had to take the chain off. Because, you know, normally there's these chains, but, but in, the, in the script, he'd gotten away, so he doesn't have a chain on. And if they left the chain on, you would have seen it. So I'm laying there on the ground. There's a 1,600-pound wild animal on this table, and everybody was immediately out of frame. You know, they could have gotten him. But no, if he had stepped off that table onto me, nobody could have physically stopped him. And I was laying there going, OK. He flinches. I roll an octopus. Because <laughs> it was just one of those weird things where it was possible. It was extremely unlikely, but it was possible. You know, is nobody thinking of this except me? <laughs> you know, but that was, that was fun. But he was great, and it was a lot of fun. And I like I like working with animals. They they lend a reality in some cases to it that is fun. You all have to work with us. Yes. 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 I see a hand on over there. The, your right, about halfway back. Marjorie, did you model before? Did you model? No. We're very convinced. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Some of the, the other, there were two other girls there, three other girls, pretty much every day. They were in the harem and all that, who were models. And so they would kind of help me out. So I would use them. Yeah. One of the things that we probably would be interested in knowing is what are you working on currently? Let's not start with Dan, because we may have a good idea what he's been working on. In the recent past, but any things? Can you tell us what your current projects are or upcoming projects? Ah, current and upcoming projects. Well, actually, um, uh, uh, current projects that are airing is a film on HBO called Widow's Kiss that I did with Beverly D'Angelo. Um, and Dennis Haysbert, which is showing right now on HBO, just started airing. Um, I have, for the last two years, uh, come in and out of being the Honorable Judge Francis Fallon on uh, CBS's The Young and the Restless. I've uh, been uh, a couple of murder trials there. I'm the Hanging Judge. <laughs> um, must. Other than that, right now I'm really concentrating on my theater company. I'm a, I'm a founder of a theater company that's located in North Hollywood called Interact Theater Company, which uh, had the uh, most awarded show in the last 10, 12 years in Los Angeles. Last year we ran for seven sold out months, a play by Elmer Rice, written in 1932 called Counselor at Law, directed and starring John Rubenstein. And uh, you know that. Oh, you, oh, good job. Okay. Um, and uh, right now we're doing a new work that I am acting in, uh, and uh, that will be open in a little while. And that's really where I've dedicated myself recently, only because I'm not doing anything else. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hopefully that will change. But I've, I've, uh, I worked uh, substantially, certainly after and before Quantum Leap, and I will. But I, I, the theater company is is really what it's all about. We actually, I, I was I was asking backstage, who's here is from Australia? Who, someone is from Australia? Are they not in the room right now? I guess not. We have a, a benefit every year that we do for our theater company, an actor named Matthew Ashford, who was on the Days of Our Lives, um, and is now in General Hospital. Uh, Days of Our Lives has a huge convention every Memorial Weekend, and we take advantage of that and have a benefit for the theater company. And we incorporated a performance of uh, Counselor at Law last year, along with the auctions and uh, everything else. Actually, it was our final performance of Counselor. And we have about, for both benefits, each year we had about 15 people fly in from Australia. Um, so I find it 
interesting and wonderful that you are so dedicated that you come from so far away to attend these conventions. Um, it's just really, really wonderful. Um, so anyway, I have some flyers about the theater company in the show. Uh, pass out later. Uh, that answers the question. Go ahead. Penny? Um, I have just one thing coming up. I appear briefly with, with Dan in The Light Shift, which is an HBO movie coming up very soon. Um, I have a five-year-old and a 16-year-old who take up a lot of my time. Wow. Yeah, I said the Whoa. same thing. He was in the green room. I thought he was a prop. I don't know. I thought he was her boyfriend. Her son from a previous life. Yes. Um, I wrote and directed a play a year and a half ago. Um, Checked it out at a small venue called the Hidden Hills Playhouse. It was very hidden and very hilly. Um, and I'm working on a, another writing project now, which I hope to direct. And that's it for me. Yeah. Um, well, I'm doing. I did an episode not too long ago. Which I don't know. You guys may have seen. I did an episode of Star Trek Voyager. Thank you. Thank you. It was such fun, and it's just gotten a lot of really positive feedback, which is very gratifying and fun, because it was just so much fun to work on, and the people there are wonderful. And Robert Picardo, who I worked with, is just, I mean, he's just, he's such a tremendous actor, and he's a very nice guy. And um, getting to know those, that whole group has been a lot of fun. But, and then I, I've done, it's funny, especially this past year or so, I've been doing a lot of science fiction, which is my personal favorite, anyway. Because I did, absolutely. <laughs> So I did Voyager, I did an episode of Deadly Games where I didn't do much of anything, but um, I, did a, I just did a pilot that's going to air sometime in the next couple of months. It's going to be a two hour pilot on CBS. We're hoping it's going to be on a Sunday night, like after 60 minutes. And it's really, really good. It's, um, it's science fiction, but it's much closer to like Star Wars than Star Trek. It's about epic adventure and, and mythological figures and this you know it's not about technical things and it's about it's this big epic adventure story you know and it's it's written by Caleb Carr who's a novelist and a really good one and it's John Corbett from Northern Exposure and um, Rod Taylor from Birds and um, you know and it's and uh, Carolyn McCormick from Law and Order and it's just um, it's really good and it's it's sort of set in the sense that, you know, if there is, like, if there's been a galactic republic of some sort that has kind of fallen apart, and it's, you know, what happens after this falls apart, and you've got these, so you've got this network of planets that are now no longer in contact with each other, and each one develops in different ways, and they compensate in different ways, and it's sort of a new dark age. And then this group of people get together um, in order to, rescue one little girl and then in, in trying to do that they uncover this other huge problem that they now have to deal with and how do you get this when you realize that there is a true evil that you know you need to face how do you get all these factionalized groups to kind of work together somehow it's it's just really good and it's very exciting and i'm very excited about it and i have this great wonderful Kind of warrior character. What's the name? Oh, it's called it's called the Osiris Chronicles. And um, there was a there was an article about it in TV Guide a couple of weeks ago. If you saw it, there's a, it was a science fiction thing. But so, so that's what I'm doing. Hopefully, I'll be doing that for the next five years. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Absolutely. Well, they're trying to get me to go to this Star Trek convention. We're trying to work that out. Go. Which would be fun. I uh, am playing Jay Leno in The Late Shift. Oh. <laughs> it's uh, on HBO next Saturday night, and uh, you know I had a little makeup, you know, I had a little work to me. You know? <laughs> uh, and I must tell you, uh, Penny doesn't have a. She's she's. I walked in and was very happy to see she was here. She's a. You're the head of NBC publicity yes. in the show, uh. so she's one of the people caught up in all the. Mechanizations of, of what goes on, and it's it's uh, should be very entertaining. Uh, and uh, we're doing a new show on CBS called Nash Bridges. This is I know I'm glad you're all sitting down. This is going to come as a shock, but Don Johnson is playing a cop 
Is that is that is that going out on a limb? He's he is he's, he's wonderful uh, in it. So if, if you have a chance, please watch that. And I just found out this week I'm going to go do a. Uh, I, that's probably me this time. And I'll put me down the finger. Oh, I uh, I'm going to do a Lois and Clark, which makes me very. <laughs> You know, I, I went and did a friend of mine, you know, I went to the audition. I have a friend, his name's Dan Schweiger, you know. And he's like this, everything's so upsetting, okay, I'm going to cry, I'm going to cry. I went into the audition and actually did him, you know. I said, here's, and I did this one, I've got to do him. Uh, and he, for a week and a half, if I thought I'd do a Jay Leno, at least I don't have to bump into Jay Leno at my party. So he's going, hey, I was watching Lois and Clark, what the, what the heck, man? I, you look familiar to me. That's what I'm. Can I share a little bit of trivia about yes, the plays sir. of the thing? Sure. May I? Yes. I thought you'd be interested in this. <laughs> Anna Gunn, uh, a beautiful actress who played uh, my wife, uh, we called ourselves on the set. It was Neil, I can't remember her name, but we called ourselves the Dullers. Because, you know, <laughs> you know, Penny uh, Fuller's dancing and Scott's got the Nehru jacket, and we're like, I were from Nebraska. <laughs> And I was, of course, being not only dull, but, you know, Bon, come home, you're, you can't act. I mean, you know, terrible. But um, Anna Gunn, who uh, years later I was uh, prosecuting in a TV movie, we were laughing. <laughs> Anna Gunn, on the first two hours of the first day of shooting, we were shooting down in Marina Del Rey, the, the, all the clubs were shot in a club down there, and the uh, first day C or second day C, that's the camera system, was running down the steps and she was coming up and he slammed right into her, I, either with his head or a piece of equipment. And she had a black eye that was this, this, I'm not kidding, it was this big. And it was, it came immediately. You know how like if you get that, and then you look at your little boy and three days later you go, God, you have a black eye. Oh yeah, this was black within 20 seconds. It was black. And uh, you cannot tell and you know, I mean, now we are, we're actors, we're all so, you know, we're megalomaniac. Well, they're not, but I am, you know. <laughs> so we're paranoid, and you know, like, I mean, we're always, you know, there's a mirror there, and I'm trying not to look at myself in it, you know. <laughs> but this poor actress had this shiner, and what is the makeup artist name? Jeremy, yes, covered this thing up. If you watch that show, you cannot tell that, and it, it not only was big, but puffed. You know, it was, she was like Quasimodo. She was like <laughs> Charles Lawton, you know. You cannot tell. She looks gorgeous from, from the beginning. To, and every day then for the poor actress was about, oh, no, I've got, you know. And every day I go, what happened to your black eye? <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, that little bit of trivia. Um, and I'm glad that you got up early to hear it. So, uh, <laughs> my God. We have a question here in the middle. I, this is uh, for Dan and James. Uh, both of you have played bad guys so effectively that as an audience, you know, you're the kind of guys uh, we love to hate. But one thing that I find about a lot of people that do play bad guys is, uh, or bad people, their personalities are so different from the characters they play. And I was just wondering if, uh, if um, any of that ever leaks over into your personal life, would you just <laughs> shut it off and forget about it once you get away from the set? Shut up and sit down. We should get that. Next question. <laughs> we were thinking the same way, I think so. Of course, that was a performance that was. We would love for you to ask questions. What do you think, James? I. I. Vinny. Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Vinny. Only Vinny. <laughs> Uh, you know what it's like being in the garbage, being pushed out to sea? <laughs> uh, I don't know, I, I think that we all, I, I, playing villains are playing spit all over the place. <laughs> Very villains. Very villains, yeah, you get to do, sink yeah. your teeth into roles. I, I, I was, I have played bad guys on and off and most of the time, but um, I don't think I'm really, hopefully I'm not really like any of those people. I mean, Vinny 
was, is more of a comic villain. It's a comic for men and comic. I, wasn't he? Yeah, oh. <laughs> Three people so. from Wisconsin thought it was <laughs> I tell you, I don't think a lot of guys from Brooklyn, but they're going. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, there's something about playing villains, I gotta tell you, that's just a lot more fun, I think, from playing. I've never played the really straight leading man role, even on the stage. Uh, there are always villains there, too, even though they may have been a leading man type. But, Villains. There's just a lot more meat there. I don't. I think we all have within our personalities, and certainly actors. What they're called upon to do is to tap into all aspects of your personality. And and I think maybe for some reason there are those of us that tap on those things easier. <laughs> or uh, for some reason I don't know what it is, but we have those other elements within us. It's. It's more challenging, it's more rewarding, um, and it's more, simply more fun, I think, to play bad guys. Why uh, Marjorie likes science fiction. I love science fiction, too. I, I, I have been, I was spent most of my career, my life, on the stage in or around New York City and regional theaters. I've been in Los Angeles since 1989, basically. The very first show I did, first prime time television show, got to satisfy something I've always wanted to do. I was in an episode, guest starred on an episode of the series which is no longer exists, Freddy's Nightmares, the series. And I had always wanted to do horror film. Yes, yes, yes. And so I got to do that. And the second episode I did out here was a Western. I did a double episode of Paradise. Um, so I had both, both of those things fulfilled right away. But I don't know, Dan agrees or just, I don't know. I mean, just villains are, are, are are fun. They're fun to play. I, I, and I, I was very fortunate for a while there where I was playing all kinds of villains. One of my favorite ones actually was a, I did very soon after or before this, Matlock, um, where I played one of the characters. You know, the character at the beginning of those shows always got killed off and the rest of the show was determining who killed them. Right. And I played a talk show host, which they did very interestingly in that they taped it. Robert Shearer directed it. And he had worked with live video stuff years ago, live film in the 50s and stuff. And he hasn't done a live show for years and years and years. So they taped this when they were doing the talk show. It looked like a talk show because they were just doing videotape straight. But when you saw it backstage or you saw the, you know, what was going on between the characters, of course, that was film. So it took it back into the realm uh, of the medium used for most of the show. Um, but my character, unlike most characters that get killed off in the first five minutes, I was around for like 20 minutes of the show, setting this whole thing up where I got stabbed in the back, literally. Um, uh, and, and that was fun. And if I might digress in television story, it doesn't relate to Quantum Leap, but to show you how authentic this show was, my grandmother, bless her heart, who is 97 years old, lives by herself in Florida, in Bradenton, Florida, and, oh, from Florida, great. Uh, she, wa I tell her whenever I'm on something, and everyone there in the trailer park and stuff, where she, she has lived since 1959 with my grandfather. My grandfather passed away a few years ago, but you know, their, their trailer park used to be in the outskirts of Bradenton. Now they're like <laughs> encompassed by everything. But she tells everybody around in her church and everything, whenever I'm gonna be on television. And most of her friends are of the same age range, or at least younger in 84 or something like that. <laughs> and she told everybody to watch Matlock. My grandson, Jimmy, is doing Matlock now, and he played, you know, I don't think she told him what she played. So she told everybody. So she comes to church after the show is aired, and this one friend comes up to her and says, well, I watched when you told me to watch, and it wasn't on. My grandmother said, yes, it was on. You didn't have it on the right station. She said, no, it wasn't on. I turned it on. She said, you couldn't have turned it on at the right time. Did you turn it on at 9? I turned it on at 9 o'clock. There was a talk show on. True story. True story. And we, and, we, and we we sit around now going, how do they believe the Martian broadcast in the 30s? These are the same people. <laughs> These are the same people. <laughs> that lady used to live in Jersey. Yeah. And she was, you know, turned it on and, you know, ran. <laughs> you know, I, I do... Uh, 
my thought on that, I, I, I was thinking about know, the first thing that, that I think uh, anybody ever paid attention to, my debut was in a film called Cave Girl, I'm sure you're all aware of it. <laughs> Never of an Academy Award considerations that year. Um, but I played a, a, a killer in River's Edge, you know, and, and learned a valuable lesson just by nature of, of the type of person I am. You know, I was married at the time, and you can't bring that home. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, going, I killed her and I felt so alive, and I go home and my wife goes, take it to garbage, and it's like, I'll kill you. <laughs> I go, I'll kill you, take out the garbage. But you know, when we were doing Quantum Leap, you know what specifically kept me sane? They opened the ET ride at Universal Studios uh, at about that same time. You know, and I went over one day because I'm really kind of, you know, other actors would probably be studying a script or something. I was like, hey, the E.T. writer. <laughs> right over there? Right here? There. How much time do I have? <laughs> so the first day I went over there, and yeah, I still remember David Andre, you know, I went up and I said, you know, I was standing in line, I said, uh, sure, why don't, come, come on up. Now I was wearing the suit, you know, so he thought I was some suit from Universal. <laughs> he said, come on up. And he put me, you know, he took me around the back, put me on my own car, and I rode the E.T. ride. You know, and I, and I, you know, I know what you think I am, but pathetically, I'm just doing this TV show. <laughs> he said, you come back anytime. So I went back, I probably rode the E.T. ride. I'd call people and go, come visit me on the set, they open the E.T. ride. <laughs> so while I was being, you know, Neil, being, you know, mom, your pathetic mom, stop acting, I was like, could you go on the E.T. ride? You know, and if you've taken that ride, I highly recommend it, because all it is is like, hey, we're E.T., yeah, you forgot to be on the ride. And it's good to be on the planet, and we look really silly. So that kept me safe. So I didn't take Neil home with me. In fact, it was hard not taking E.T. to Quantum Leap. They'd be like, okay, let's go. Dad, 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 you're like, where are you getting this kind of dancey singing bit? This is a dramatic sing, scene, and you know, you're jumping. Oh, I'm sorry, I was. That's all. That's all about E.T. The Universal Studios tour, I highly recommend it. And they didn't pay me to say that. Much. We have a question right in the front row on your right. Hi, questions for Penny. Um, I've been watching you since uh, Return of uh, <laughs> and I really enjoyed all your work. Um, I was wondering if maybe you had a fun story about the Fisk Kid. Oh, you're good. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I remember uh, when I did that movie, uh, I was quite intimidated by uh, Robert Aldrich, <laughs> who the late director. He was quite, quite a character. And so I was kind of timidly walking around the set, and I was, well, as you know, I was playing Gene Wilder's uh, bride, and Harrison Ford was in this picture, and this was in between Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. He was about to go off and do that. And, um, it's not really an amusing story. It's just the first thing I, I think of. I was I had to wear. It took place in the 1800s, and I had a huge hoop skirt, wedding dress on, and I was looking for a place to sit. And I found this little apple box, and I kind of straddled it and lowered myself <laughs> down onto it. And then I thought, I'm never gonna be able to get up. So I'm, and I'm sitting there waiting for them to set up, and and Harrison Ford came over to me and sat down on a, a fellow apple box, and and he said. You having a good time? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, I'm, you know. <laughs> and, um, and I said, are you having a good time? And he said, there are a lot of really serious people around here. <laughs> Frisco Kid was a yeah. 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 comedy. Oh, yeah. 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 Although, yeah. although it had a lot of violence, it, it was weird, because it had some very violent moments, but it was a comedy. Anyway, and, and I just remember him being very, very sweet to me, and I felt so much better after that, which was good, because I think I had to kiss him right after that. And so I was happy to have had some interaction. <laughs> just just a little. It always helps before those scenes. Usually it's, hi, how do you do? Okay, into bed, you two. <laughs> it's usually inevitably you get the bed scene or the kiss on the first day before you've even had a cup of coffee together, and it's very, very disconcerting. So that's, uh, I think that's my favorite memory. Well, most of the time I just sort of stood at attention, hoping that Robert Aldrich was not going to yell. <laughs> but that was a fun, that was a fun movie. Next question's over here on your left. 
in the front. You lose all of you. you. All of you have done wonderful work in the past. And I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a lot more wonderful work for all of you in the upcoming future. What I want to know is the past, what is the past, the future is coming up for you guys. What is it that you all want to do as the other one is done and that you want to move on to the following year of 1997? Well, Brad, I want you to be my agent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, yes, Mark. Um, well, I'm hoping that I'll be that I'll be doing this series. That's what I really hope. Because when when you find something that that really means a lot to you and you get to work with a good group of people, you just want to be there. It's like I want to go there every day <laughs> because it's really really cool. And so that's what I'm hoping. And I enjoy working in television. I mean, I like doing films too, but I, I really like television. I like being over there. I like the notion of doing a series for five years and evolving a character over that kind of time. You know, which doesn't often happen in TV series, but it is possible. And if in, in certain projects with certain people, they, they get that. They're like, oh God. Gee, my life isn't the same as it was five years ago, so maybe this character's life changes, you know. So that's what that's what I'm hoping for. And and some film work too, because there's some interesting projects that I'm looking for <laughs> trying to get in on, you know. <laughs> so Well I'm I'm working on um I I've, I've been doing television for twenty years. And <coughs> now I'm kind of I think a lot of a lot of people, when they get a little older, they start saying, well, you know, I think I have something to say, and I'd like to try to find a way to say it. Uh, so I think uh, my own wish for myself is to keep um, developing projects that I'm interested in. I've been writing for four or five years now, and uh, it's a new thing for me. Four or five years isn't a very long time, really, to do anything, especially something like writing. Um, <laughs> so that's what I'm looking for for myself, to create things that I'm interested in that I don't see being done or that aren't available for, for me to do. Uh, um, had my first baby in November. <laughs> I just happen to have a photo album here. <laughs> I've shot more film on this kid than Mike Watkins in the entire year. <laughs> Mike Watkins, by the way, is or was, do you, do you all know this? Uh, um, uh, who brought us the little rascal? Hal Roach. Hal Roach. He's Hal Roach's son in law. Oh, was. Was. Well, Hal passed away at, 100, at 145. <laughs> I think Michael, I turned myself. Michael is divorced. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there I'm back on. Um, so, you know, uh, they keep taunting us with The Fugitive 2, which uh, we would love to go and chase some other uh, villain somewhere. Uh, maybe it'll be James, since he likes it. <laughs> um, so, uh, who knows, you know, the, it's just, it's fun to be able to um, do work. This type of thing, to have you all come and, and say you like something, is very heartwarming for us. You know, it's, it's I, you know, these, this letter came out of the blue and I thought, I, I'd love to go talk to people who, who, usually I talk to my mom and she likes everything, you know. <laughs> and, and I don't see her here today, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I hope that uh, I see you guys at the Lois and Clark convention and uh, the Star Trek convention and whatever else you, you, uh, you'd like to, to go and see. And maybe one day work again with Scott, who is without a doubt the hardest working man in oh, show yes. business. No doubt about it. <clears throat> and you know, you know what Scott says when he thinks, come back, come on back, you know, come and stop in. We, I think everybody was telling a story like that. And I, I went back one day, I was on a lot, let's go see, you know, and usually you're, you're, you expect them to go, oh, I don't care what he said. You know, we're shooting a show in here. But I went in and it was a show, it was uh, one of John Anderson's last shows, that cowboy show. Oh, and you know that? And uh, I felt because, you know, so I was like, come on in! 
<laughs> and then you look around and you see all those people who are all so friendly with such a great show. You know, and the director who has no idea who you are, but it's just like, hey, 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 Scott? we're shooting the show. <laughs> yeah. Scott, can you get, and Scott is, yo, what's going on? How are you doing? <laughs> so uh, we probably may have all had that experience. Anyway, so uh, I don't know if I answered the question, uh, but I'm done talking now. James. <laughs> um. I'd like to reiterate that. I mean, Scott was wonderful, and I, I, I had the good fortune of doing a number of things at Universal after uh, that, and I would stop by, and he was incredible that way. Uh, that looks great. Come in, you know, and, and everybody, <laughs> and, and people would say, you know, it's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, oh, we're shooting here, uh, buddy. Hey, I, I, you know, I don't know, but I was Minnie the last, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, last season, don't remember. <laughs> And Scott and Dean and, and Michael Watkins, uh, you know, they were they were all wonderful that way. Um, specifically to answer Brad's question, um, yes, I am hoping to do a lot more in television and film because that's where uh, that's where I earn my money. Um, I'm also uh, a photographer, and since we've had a theater company, uh, which is now four years old as a not-for-profit theater corporation, I'm the production photographer for all of the uh, shows that we do. Uh, so I've had my pictures public, published in the LA Times, every printed art, uh, print or magazine, newspaper in LA when they run reviews of the shows and stuff, they print. So I'm going more in the photography vein. And for my theater company, right now we're doing a play, we have a play development lab, in the particular, we're opening two shows actually, a play by C.P. Taylor called And the Nightingale Sang, which is a wonderful, wonderful play about uh, England, uh, English family in world, pre-World War II. That opens in a week. And then we're doing a new piece, which I'm in as an actor, that's going to run Wednesday and Thursdays only from our play development lab. We have a play development lab. And um, this is a new piece uh, by actually eight different writers and nine different directors and 19 actors are in it. Then in the fall, I'm waiting to get the rights for a particular play, which I can't mention um, right now, because somebody else might want to do it. Um, <laughs> And I want to get the rights first, which John Rubenstein will be directing. Um, although he's, that's dependent, of course, on his show right now. He's opening in two weeks on Broadway, and I kind of hope his show closes so he can come out <laughs> direct the play for the company, which he really wants to do. But it has about a cast of about 22. Um, my theater company, and I've, I've talked about it too much, but it, it, it was formed by a group of actors from New York who, who were unhappy with theater in L.A. We'd all come out here about the same time in 1989. We all knew each other from New York City. Many of us are graduates uh, of the Juilliard School or in New York or, or other similar classical training backgrounds. And we got together just to read plays for ourselves, for ourselves, literally, not for anybody else, just to keep our, our stuff working because most television does not have like the high quality script that something like Quantum Leap does, which was always interesting and good, or um, you know, Star Trek, which has wonderful scripts. Um, uh, it just you don't get that all the time doing hanging with Mr. Cooper. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we did that, and we found ourselves all of a sudden becoming an actual theater company. Um, we've received in the last three years 24 awards, 27 awards for our work, including seven Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle awards, 14 Drama Logs, LA Weekly Award, four Ovation awards this year, a lot of other nominations and stuff. So. Really, my emphasis this year, later in the year, is going to be on this one production, which is, I can say, it's a Tom Stoppard play. Um, and hopefully we'll have that same kind of success. So I may be, for the first time in my life, bussing tables to make some money so I can afford to do my theater up at my theater company. Um, that's it. Go to bed. It's like that didn't happen. Um, 
we started shooting that episode, we did the whole, all the outdoor stuff and the lion and the 30 people and out at Disney Ranch and the bridge and all the hysteria, you know. And then the last four days, we were on, this, on the stage at Universal and the last three days was just all the scenes with myself and Scott. And then there, there were a couple with Dean. And um, so by then, you know, I got, we got to know each other a little bit. And he really is a wonderful actor to work with. You know, and it's, and you just, you get to know him, and I was, and I was also, it was the first time that I'd ever kissed anybody or anything like that on camera, and it's, you know, it's pretty scary, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't <laughs> And plus, what, actually, the physicality of the scene helped me, because I'm trained in theatrical combat, you know, fights I can do. <laughs> okay, it's the kissing, I'm like, oh, I'm drunk. And what we ended up doing was we shot, like, the whole morning, and I, and I think we were doing the, the, some of the withdrawal scenes, you know, so it's very, and we, were, we would rehearse this, you know, some of that s stuff, and um, so you really get a feel for, you're, you're doing a scene, you're interacting with somebody, you know, and it's, and Scott is great, and then, so after lunch we come back, and he basically said, okay, and we just sort of worked out, we're like, this is the apartment, and, you know, Michael was carrying a camera around, you know, because we did that all in one take, that whole thing, from the time I come out of the room to all in the kitchen and back and out and around and fighting on, on the floor and in the pickup, and it goes all one shot, you know. And we just kind of said, okay, this is the room. And Scott said, all right, what if we do this? And then we do this, and then we do that, and we do this. And, it was fun. and then we just started rehearsing it. I went, mean, okay. And I was like, I push my kid here and get down the floor. And <laughs> Dancing with somebody who really knows what you're do what they're doing, you just go, okay, you lead. <laughs> yeah. But because of the like, especially when I lean back on the table and they're fighting, it's like when you you get your body involved, suddenly you just you're not worried about it anymore. That's what I found for me. It's like because once I was actually fighting and then falling and rolling, and it's you can't worry about it. So you just kind of it just sort of flows. And we did it in two takes. We did it twice, all the way through twice. And Second one, and Michael was. But during that, that there's that middle section where you go, okay, then we're going to end up here. We've got to go. Okay, well, we've got the table's going to be here. So Michael's got the camera. Over here. Okay, well, is this better or is this over here? You know, you're like, well, what about? Okay, what if we do this? <laughs> but then once it all goes together, I was just very fortunate to be doing it with him. <laughs> We have about five minutes left, and we have a question here. Uh, this is for Dan Robach. Um, a lot of times when you film a scene, there's different takes, and you cut it all together later. So uh, I almost hesitate to ask this, but uh, uh, when you're in the audience reacting to this new Hamlet performance, oh, yeah. are you <laughs> reacting to something that you're actually seeing? Or <laughs> I went to Scott first thing in the morning. And I said, Scott, I'm kind of a method actor. We don't have to do it on the set, but pull your pants down. Right Let me just. And he's a professional. That's a, a big fat lie. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't ask. Him. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just, I, you know what you're reacting to, you react, you know what you're reacting to? Michael Watkins going, okay, damn, we're on you. Okay, we're on you. <laughs> you react to that, and then you go, well, like this. But I, I the whole idea of, of them doing Hamlet nude, I was grateful, actually, that we didn't have to see any of it. <laughs> You know, my, my fear is the odd couple of the honeymooners watching Hamlet at all is a little hard. <laughs> so uh, that, that's a good one. But no, I wasn't in. We have questions in our lab. Um, this is Rolla. I was just wondering. You could put your microphone up close to your mouth. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if there was anything special or different that happened behind the scenes in each of the episodes. 
We always start with you, Marjorie. Go ahead. Okay, should we go to James? Let's go to James. James, tell us about your theater. Anything. I will. As a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, the Interact Theater Company, <laughs> behind the scenes, how this relates to Quantum Leap. Uh, no, I, other than my mistaking my car getting stolen, um, I don't think there was anything, uh, I mean, there was no accidents that happened, there was nothing uh, out of the ordinary that I can, I can think of. I mean, it was such a, it really was such a good time, and, and uh, I, can, I can tell you, many more stories about the shows where you don't have a good time on. Those are the ones that you see have a lot of stuff that seems to be going on behind the scenes. Um, I think that are uh, questionable or, or funny or odd, but uh, I can't really recall anything uh, other than that stupid mistake of mine. Why is that? Didn't they throw pies at the end of that episode? Pies? No. 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 Oh, you're talking about, you're talking about at the end, not on camera? Right. No, 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 but I mean the pies, because there was no pies in the show. If they did, ah, uh, I wasn't, uh, I was gone on to another project when they were, uh, I mean, I wasn't there, I couldn't be for, you're talking about like at the wrap at the end of the last episode? They may have, because the last stuff that they were doing was the, the, the garbage pit that he was digging around in and stuff. That may very well have happened. If it happened, I just fortunately or unfortunately <laughs> the, the only The only practical joke I think that they did on your episode was they painted your car gray. When you were shooting. Maybe that was... <laughs> You know, the week I worked, I would, I mean, everyone on the crew just adored him, and I've, I've never seen someone who was starring on a series be so involved, you know, with everybody behind the scenes. And, and I would see Scott pulling cables and helping to set lights, and this was just, you know, he, nothing he made a big deal out of. Unless well, any of you will hear from my Odyssey, then I'm sure he didn't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, I just, I just think that's... Union yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was all fake Us. stuff. They would leave for yeah. Scott around. <laughs> he liked to help out. Scott liked to help out. They leave some stuff over to the side. Yes. Scott would pull. Yes. And they never told them the truth. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's nonsense, right? <laughs> anyway, I was very impressed by that. You know, and everyone just, I've just, I've done four television series, and no star of any series I've ever been on is behaved that way and, and I, I, I just thought he was how, he was remarkable. Just very involved in every single scene and like you were talking about how he was, you know, very creatively involved in how to choreograph your scene. I mean the man is just, you know, he, he's a real artist and, and you, you don't necessarily say that about, you know, every you know, every actor in a position like that. So I was very impressed by him. Oh, Margaret Thompson. One thing that I found amusing personally was that there was the day that we all had the harem dealies on, you know, with the funky makeup, and we actually were these harem girls. It was for a photographic shoot. And, and um, you know, when you watch movies, and whenever anything happens on a movie on a movie lot, you know, they're like, here we are at the you know, Acme movie lot, and they always have people walking around in stupid costumes, three musketeers out of the harem girls, which you never see on an actual lot. You know, when's the last time? Then somebody did a remake of Kismet, you know, you just don't <laughs> see But uh, there we were, actually walking around the Universal lot in these hair and uh, these found fairly <laughs> <laughs> We were all very popular. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tour. We were, it was pretty funny. But, um, no, it was just, it's true, it was really just a wonderful experience. I mean, he's a tremendous actor and, and, and just, Wonderful to work with, you know. It's like you know what's going on in the scene, and these characters are two real people. This is really, you know, it's it's just so rewarding to have that kind of work situation, and um, and you don't always, obviously, and um, that was fun. And then we had 
And our show, a lot of the amusement behind the scenes came from um, either just teams got together, and if you, could, if you guys have ever been to one of these before and you've seen them together in person, they're hysterical. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that was about, and plus all the animals, we had the line, we had the cats, the, you know, the four-ton cats, who, they were like prop cats, they never actually moved. <laughs> there were some cats who moved, who like, there was this thing where I opened the refrigerator and they run, those were the moving cats. And then you had the other cats who never moved. You would pick them up and they'd sit there, perfectly calm. You'd put them down, they'd sit there, and they wouldn't move. That was their job. <laughs> that was where most of the just mild amusement came from. <laughs> and the great eyelashes. Yeah. Oh, that was, but no, it was just great. Seems like that. Uh, thank you for. <laughs> I was just going to say how, you know, Scott Bakula was so rude all the time. <laughs> Don't you say that. <laughs> I'm, just about, I'm just kidding. I was making a joke. I mean, he really was the hardest working man in show business, and that's how I refer to him to this day. I've never seen someone work so hard. And, and one day, maybe I'll work that hard myself. <laughs> I, I, I did think of one thing. I, 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 no, no, actually, no, I will say about that, but no. Um, what you were saying about going up to E.T. didn't remind me of something I had totally forgotten about. Uh, and I did it both, but I was doing quantum leap in that line. I, I do like to play practical jokes on people sometimes if, if you know, we're up for it. Um, I have been told, and I know that it's the truth, and it's funny, for a number of years I wasn't told this because he no longer had a series, but now that he has a series, now it's coming back again. I have been told that there is an actor who has a series that looks an awful lot like me. His name is Alan Thicke. Oh. <laughs> and you know, when you're out there shooting at the stages, the Universal Tour does come by. <laughs> And I would stand out there in my suit and whatnot with the sunglasses on. And I would not discourage anyone from thinking that I was Alan Thicke. I had an awful lot of pictures taken. I'm sure a lot of people. home to South Carolina and they said, yo, hey, Alan Thicke, he was out there soon. And I got him, yeah. Stood right next to him, yep. Put my arm around him, everything. He didn't mind. No. <laughs> How many people here have their picture taken with Alan Thicke? About <laughs> six years ago. All of you very, very much. We do have a drawing that we'd like maybe you can help us with. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, just very quickly, yesterday someone was not here. The number number was 359-383. It was for the Thrill of the Hunt uh, script. Wait, what was that number? <laughs> <laughs> We'll have it, and we have the name, so. All right, this is for the script from Seabride. It's signed by Scott, Dean, Scott, Will, and Beverly. Put Dean, Will, and Beverly. Is Beverly here? No, Beverly. No. She's here. I've asked. I said, where is Beverly? Is she here? Is she hiding out there? Well, I'll sign it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Beverly's name was only one above mine. <laughs> Here you go, Mr. Harper. Oh, there it is. All righty. And, and you want me to draw a, a ticket there? Okay. Draw your name. Draw I hope you. Know, I signed it, Alan Thick. I hope. <laughs> I'll call it. This number is three six zero seven eight five. Three six zero seven eight five. Is that it? Is that it? You have that number? Okay.
Rules for the Quantum Leap book. Carol Merrill has nothing on any of us. Quantum Leap book, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we have uh, three, five, nine, five, seven, nine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.